football DNA. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce a very good friend of mine, an excellent player, adversary over the years. I was tough battles against this guy as well. Fantastic fella, Mr. Sean Derry. Sean, welcome to football DNA, sir. Cheers, Jim. Great to have you. Now, I won't talk about the the stories we've just been saying off camera. <laughs> so we'll go on the, we'll go on the, your career, you know, you, you went into the coaching and that, you know, you, you had a fantastic career, you know, and I wrote down before, you know, over 650 league games, 200 games as a manager, so, you know, this guy knows, you want to talk about football, this guy knows what he's talking about. So if we go on your career, Sean, you know, started off at Notts County, as, yeah. a, as a YTS, was it back in the days then, or academy? Yeah, that's right. Started off on my 10th birthday. Played my first birthday, actually. Sorry, played my first game on my 10th birthday. And um, stayed there until I was 20 years old. So, obviously the game's changed now. And the terminologies of the um, the, the old the pit APs, the, the YTSs, now the scholars. Um, so, I played all my... Um, Early days in the in the Notts County Intermediates um, up in Nottingham and played on a Sunday morning and kind of Fantastic. you know just as you see all the scholars now playing you know my son's in the system now and I'm taking him on a Sunday morning so it brings back some brilliant. fantastic memories. No, oh, brilliant. I mean I, I know Notts County. Like, I mean I was a little bit older than you at the time, but so I was YTS as you was sort of schoolboy coming through then. So. Remember you well. Oh, good things I hope. <laughs> not, not all, but, uh, <laughs> but I'd like to think uh, amazing the man you are today and the crew you had. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was a um, it was a really, really fantastic football club to have a great up upbringing in professional football. Yeah. I think um, in terms of the levels that we played at, um, we've all. If I can take you back, perhaps, well. 30 years now when, when, when scary, you, really. it is scary when you look at the teams we played on them Sunday mornings you know there's some fantastic games no more so than Nottingham Forest on a Sunday morning a real old fashioned battle proper rivalry when they big there. rivals but Birmingham Aston Villa yeah. Leicester City yeah. you know these were Absolutely, big, big it? teams and it's very di it was very different back then to what it is now um, I think the games meant more back then because it was it was your own league it was your own real intensity of becoming a footballer Absolutely. and it meant so much to you as a young kid yeah and I think like, I always remember Mick Walker was my youth team manager I think he was, he was at, uh, John Gorn after that and it, it, even these just instilled it in you didn't they the, yeah. the winning mentality was there I mean in my youth team just going off mine was like there was 15 lads who was not great players we had a couple where Michael Johnson, who, was a, who went on at Birmingham and, and played Derby and did really well. But apart from that, there was no one really blessed with. But because they had such a work ethic yeah. and that will to win that was instilled in by the management, yeah. everyone went on a really good career. Most, at least a dozen of them, went on and played, you know, for a, for a lot of years. Yeah. Played league football, which is which is testament to it. But it was, and I think back in them days, you know, Notts County was that club that this Nottingham Forest were, were and are still are a wonderful football club and but, and they held so many players but if you fell out of the system at Forest Notts County was so close in terms of the standards in terms of the levels of competition between both football clubs so there was that rivalry really intense and that took me forward into my career yeah. and them early days as a as a 14 year old all the way through to an 18 year old where I made my debut there and then my first move into Sheffield United it was them values that I carried on all the so way through my So you kept all the values from, from the youth team from going forward into there Do you, that had a big impact on your career then didn't it because I mean I, I played against you a lot of times watched you play as well and you was you know you was tough tackling you got around the pitch you was you know you, you was a captain really weren't you tell me you was you archetypal captain do you think that comes from in, was that in you already or was that Bought out of you by the management then and the youth team I think, environment? I think everybody's got a story to tell and I think that's great when you can look back on your playing career and have this opportunity to speak. But I think if I can take you back to the upbringing of my family, you know, we was born, I've got two brothers, two older brothers, one five years older than me, one ten years older than me. So, you know, as of many footballers, not just back then, but still to this day, you know, from a humble background, um, fight or flight, 
survival techniques, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> being brought up on a, a council estate in Nottingham with, you know, a mum and dad who made so many sacrifices, but them sacrifices was to put food on the table, them sacrifices to make sure that we had football boots on a Sunday morning, to make sure that the opportunities that everybody had, I had the same. And I think it was back then days on the Rosegarth Walk estate in Nottingham, they're the ones that I carried through even until the final match that I've just managed as, as Cambridge United manager. You don't ever forget about them formative years because they are the years that create your personality and your character. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, we've had this, I've had this conversation on the, with a few people. I, th- I agree, it's sort of your environment you grow up in, you know, you, your parents and your family are such a big part in that, aren't yeah. they, as well? And then, obviously, the coaches can help you. Help you get to that. I mean, see, you still talk about. Well, I mean, we'll touch on Cambridge and managerial in a little while, but to say you still hold them values dear, you know, 30, 40 years on, it's, mm. it, you know, it just shows how important they are, doesn't it? Well, they do, and you know, I'm blessed that I've got children of my own, and you know, my boy's ten years old and he's starting his journey on in in, a, in, in what's a new type of um, junior upbringing in in an academy system. And um, you still try and, you know, with the greatest respect to um, other players, other parents, you know, other families that are in that system. You know, I've been privileged to have a 20-year football pedigree behind me. So I kind of know a little bit about the system, but I don't want him to lose sight of what's really important. And that's his character. That's his morals. You know, that's his professionalism. Mm. Even at 10 years old, and I'm not saying he's going to go on and make it because you never know what's around the corner. But whether he's a footballer for two, ten, or twenty years, you want him to have these yeah. fundamentals that he never loses. Absolutely, he carries that in, in life. Like you say, it's not even just about football, is it? You know, we all want to go and want the sons and daughters to go and play the best level they can, etc. But you want them to have, you know, be really decent people. Absolutely, and I think that beliefs sort of, you know, take through life on that. And you need the right type of characters to help them progress because listen yeah. I'm a dad first and foremost yeah. and yes of course you know I'm, I'm an ex-player and an ex-manager but I am his dad but when it comes to people who he's going to listen to he's going to be listening to the coaches so young coaches now have such a massive pivotal role in how our players are going to develop and that's what intrigues me and that's what I don't ever want to lose sight of Yes, football's move, moving, it moves at such a great pace, but I want to try and keep a little bit of the old as well because I, I think that stems you in, you know, for what's around the corner. Yeah. Because there's some tough days in football. You've seen it yourself, Jim, you've experienced the highs, the lows and the sideways of, of football. And you need to, you, what's going to take you back to the start? Well, it's, it, it, it's these relationships, it's father it's values, sons, well, it's, it's your values, it's your coaches, and uh, I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. No, I think you're right, that's a really, it's a, it's a real good point that as well, especially with the topic, you know, with the academy people, the lads are getting released and, you know, how they cope with it after, and is there enough support networks and all that, so it's, it's a massive point if you can, you know, teach, like you say, the young coaches nowadays, if you're taking the young fellas, have got such an important role. Yeah. Such an important role. That was great. What, um, so, you went from Notts County, yeah. and am I right in saying you went to Palace after that? No, I went, I went, I went to Notts County straight into, um, it was funny really, because I played on the Saturday against your, uh, your club that you're at now, Lincoln. We beat them 5-3 um, back in 98, and um, it was the year that we got promoted into, into the, uh, the old first division, I think it was. Um, so we'd run away with the league. I thought I was going to be at Notts County until right at the very end of the season. There'd been a lot of interest in, in me through different football clubs. And then I got a phone call on a Sunday, and it was the chairman, Derek Pavis. He's not here with us now, God bless his soul, but he, he's, he, he was a real huge personality. Was, was, was just a massive personality, Derek was. And um, he rang me at home, and it was my mum, answered the phone, and um, the chairman was on the phone, he said, Son, we've sold you. <laughs> And I had no saying. I didn't know where I was going, yeah. and it was Sheffield United. And thankfully, it was it was only up the road in from Nottingham to Sheffield. Yeah. But I went into I played on the Saturday against Lincoln, 
and then I played a Yorkshire derby on the Tuesday night. It's incredible how it works that. At Bramall Lane against Huddersfield, I think they won 2 1, and there was 25, 26,000 there. And what was it? What was it? Not scouted, four or five thousand. Well, yeah, generally at Meadow Lane, you know, yeah. it was five, six thousand, yeah. and you know, obviously lower gates, less lesser expectations, and then suddenly I'm um, exposed oh, into this championship team with big players, ex-internationals. You know the Dean Saunders, Jan Olga Fjortofs, yeah, yeah. Brian mm-hmm. Deans. You know, and you, as a young kid, you're thinking. Are you ready for this? And what age was this? I was 20. This is 20. So I played two years as a professional and then I was sold for 700 grand and it was it was a big deal. Yeah, that's, you know, that's it, big money. It right, was a it? big move because, you know, not too often were players at that level transferred for the money that was no. exchanging. No one missed the pay, just just said you sold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Derek, Derek <laughs> loved earning a little bit of money um, on, on young players. It, Notts County have done really well over the course of a number of years. Loads of young players, Tommy Johnson, yeah, really Mark Draper, you, you know, the really Yankees nice and people like that. They all got sold and you know, I was next on the production line. Yeah. And, Brilliant. You know, I've ended going to Sheffield United and spending two years there. So just to get thrown into that, I mean, going on what we touched on before, like, so all your beliefs and your values, that, that probably stands you in real good stead to go, because it, it does just happen like that in football, doesn't it? And you, you, your whole world changes within a day, within a few hours. Well, it did. And, you know, it, it not so only just changed... You've got to be quite grounded. Absolutely. To go, just go and play, otherwise you'd be... Well, you've got to not... You've, you've, you, for me, my overriding thought at that time was, don't lose sight of what you're going for. You're still going to be playing a 90-minute game. You're still going to be playing with 21 other guys. Yeah. It's still a game of football. Yeah. You've still got to try and maximise. Yes, you're going to be open to 25, 26,000 people with a bigger, more vocal opinion of what they're seeing, but it is a game. Yeah. yeah no, As I always at. tried to, it didn't matter whether I played for Notts County. I suppose that keeps you on a real level as well. Absolutely. It? It keeps you on a nice level, not too high, not too low. Don't lose sight of what we're in the game for, and that is to play football. Absolutely. It's not the, it's not the, you know, it's not the clothes, it's not the watches, it's not the cars, it's not the houses. It's the game. Yeah. It's the game, and that's what I love about being involved in football. In it, Greg, just going on like that. I mean, so you you could sort. You're talking about them games now, and you, you just remember them like the yesterday, don't you? You can remember everything like that. You, like I said, you can't remember what you bought that week. You know, you can't remember. You remember your teammates. Yeah. You remember the games. You remember the results. Yeah. You remember the, the atmosphere. So it's. It's an amazing thing, and that's one thing why you shouldn't ever lose sight of your football to play football. Absolutely. And a lot of players, I think, they do lose that a little bit earlier. And, and that, was, that was always in the back of my mind, because don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not one of these guys who thinks that you shouldn't enjoy what football brings, because I think you should. I think young players should go out and go out and have a night out. I think they should experience different situations that get presented, good, bad and indifferent. I think that's a learning curve, but ultimately, the overriding conversation that I had either as a player or as a manager, I, I like talking about the game yeah. to players and to individuals yes. and to fans and to anybody who likes football because we've all, we all share this massive desire and that is to be involved in the game and that's what I love about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a beautiful game for that reason, isn't it, as well? Everyone's got an opinion on it. So it's nice, you know, when, when you've got such a, as much knowledge as you've got in football now, to go and share it with people is, is fantastic. I think that's, you know, why you made a good manager, which we'll, we'll come on to in a little bit as well. So from Sheffield United, I mean, you're best known for probably QPR, Palace, Leeds. Yeah. So you've had some, there's some good clubs there you've been at. I mean, was there, was there, that's a lot of managers you've played for. Did they sort of help shape you? Is there any one in particular yeah. that helped shape your sort of, your beliefs from then on as well? Of course, you know, I had a, a, a varied career in terms of, I wasn't the, I, I never wanted to be the player that just stayed at one club for a long period of time. I wanted this, uh, and I said this early on in my career, I wanted it to be a varied career in terms of playing at different, yeah. in different parts of the country. I played up in the north for Sheffield United and for Leeds United, and then I played in the south for Portsmouth and for Palace yeah, and for QPR. And I wanted it to be varied because I wanted to experience being a young guy and 
and playing in different parts of the country help you do that. But along the way, you know, you know, we know what the game's like. You can be there for 10 minutes or for, for three years and playing with different types of managers. Yeah. And along the way, I've been very fortunate to play with some very good, very good managers and some managers who I didn't agree with yeah. along the way. You're not going to agree with everyone, are you? No. That's, that's why it's the beans, even with your managers and, and your teammates as well. Absolutely. So do you think, so just going like that, so did you know then you was going to like become a coach, you'd stay in football after, or was it just, I'm thinking nothing along that, I'm just thinking football, I'm playing football? Or... It, the defining moment for me was when I was at Leeds United. I'd had a, um, a number of games, a senior professional, arrived up at Ellen Road, you know, it was the first year that Leeds had been relegated out of the Premier League, so the expectation was massive, you know, Ellen Road was 30, 35,000 every other week. Great atmosphere. It was just this massive pressure, bubbling cauldron, that whoever was going to be the group of guys that got Leeds United back in the Premier League were going to be lauded forever. Yeah. So I took that upon myself and Brilliant. I really felt kind of re-energised on the back of what was a disappointing only three or four months from Palace when I'd lost my place. Yeah. Palace had got promoted into the Premier League. Ian Dowie decided that he wanted to use yeah, exactly, yeah. younger players. And I was a 27-year-old, 28-year-old player then who didn't feel that could perhaps benefit Crystal Palace at the time. So a new experience, experience beckoned. And I had a great year. And we got to the playoff final and lost 3-0 to um, Watford. And Watford went into the Premier League and we, we obviously didn't. But the next year, I had a horrible injury away at Stoke. And it was a real innocuous collision with Mamadi Sadibi. And I thought I was only going to be out for two weeks. I was out for 11 months. Really? And um, I had a, a problem with my heel where it was, a bru it was a bruise, it bled, but then it calcified and bone growth start had formu formulated on my heel. So I had three operations and 11 months later, I was at crossroads in my career. Yeah. Was I going to continue and try and continue this um, rehab that was driving me crazy or was I going to come out of the game and I didn't want to lose I didn't want to leave the game but I didn't I didn't have the fight for another period of time out of yeah. out of the game thankfully I got myself back but within that time of 11 months I was looking at my options yeah and the options I looked at back then was coaching and I and I looked from a different angle, even though I was still a player, I looked from a different angle at the game, and that's where coaching seemed to be the natural progression. Well, that's where that's what age was you there? 29. So that's 29, so that's still early, still young, isn't it? Yeah. It was, and sometimes you do, you do when you, because I was the same, like when you play, when you play week in, week out, you, you just do football, getting ready for the next game, but when you, fortunately, when you do have an injury, which is you know, probably the hardest things in football anyway for me, if you can use that time to watch it, yeah. and learn from it that, I think you've got your mindset is you're going to go down the coaching route aren't you if you get because yeah. some players can't watch games no. I know players who once they're injured they'd rather not watch a game and you know, so they're probably not going to go down that route but if you watch it and you can study it a little who was the manager then? The, the manager at the time was Dennis Wise and when, when, when I go back to earlier on in the, in the piece where I said some good some indifferent I experienced at that time with Dennis a completely different way of a manager managing a football club in terms of the man management styles. Right. Because up until that point, largely I'd had good experiences. And me and Dennis clashed right. at that time. And Dennis arrived, you know, if I can kind of paint a picture, Dennis arrived as a legend for Chelsea. Yeah. The chairman at the time, Ken Bates, was yeah. the chairman for Chelsea. Yeah. Leeds and Chelsea were obviously, you know, rivals through long periods of time in football. So there was this kind of mix that because the club wasn't really maximising what the talents were and we fell into this um, negative state at Leeds United, there was a real toxic atmosphere that was generated through a Ken Bates through a Dennis yeah. Wise through a Leeds United and it was just it wasn't the best feeling yeah. and I was injured 
and I could see all this unraveling, you know, in front of my eyes. So as a player, as a 29 year old, I was able to take a step back because I wasn't put in that position to play on a Saturday afternoon and I could see my management skills right. and I could see how Dennis was kind of, you know, uh, and Dennis, if he was sat here, would have his a different angle on things, I'm sure, but from my angle, I could see how it was so important to get the best out of the players, regardless. Right. And that was the first part... So even though you clash with with Dennis and weren't quite the chemistry weren't there between you two was he good at getting the best out of all the players it was he, yeah he, he, struggled he, he, he got the best out of certain players but what I saw then with my own eyes was and it highlighted just how different individuals are and you can't beat everybody with the same stick right. some people will need our arm around them some people will need you know yeah. words some people will need actions everybody's different yeah and I just saw a manager at the time treating everybody the same. Right. And I felt then, yes, it worked for certain yeah. players, but it didn't for others. And it was then, that was a real valuable lesson for me, yeah. that, hang on a minute, yeah. everyone's different. Well, I, I think that's a massive, that's a massive thing. I mean, as a manager, yeah, you can have all the tactics or, you, you know, the nouns, but if you're not getting the best out of every player, I think you've got to find out which, what pushes your buttons. Yeah. So someone might need a kick up the backside. They might respond really well to it. Yeah. Some people might fold under that. So you have to, I suppose, you have to find out. Yeah. What what pushes, what floats the boat, sort of thing. Absolutely. Gets them on the pitch, being the best they can be. Yeah. Because imagine really nothing about it. it's players, are you? You need your players. You need your players. And you know, I've been lucky enough to experience promotions. You know the 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 real soul destroying times of relegations. Yeah. yeah. But within it all, I've seen the relationships of. If you can get the manage, if you can get the players, and you're not going to get all of them, because no. it's impossible. But more often than not, if you can get the majority on side, yeah, compared to yeah. the minority that will always be, you know, looking at the cups, kind of half empty, yeah, rather yeah. than you all do four. A lot of them players are that as well. Absolutely, yeah. a, lot that, a lot of lads like that. Yeah, you, you do. You know, we we encounter them every day. Yeah. But if you can get them to look at the cup half full, yeah. Generally, you'll have a successful yeah, team. So you took that really from that time. So at 29, you're, you're probably starting to think down there. I started I thinking, you know. and I think, you know, the, 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 the final six years of my career as a player from 29 to 35 were great in terms of the pitch and what I'm, how I maximised my own ability. Because right. I wasn't the best player, but I had a fantastic outlook in terms of the hunger and desire for the game. That's great. And I wanted to make sure Do you think that, that time, sorry, do you think that time out as well give you another thing, right, yeah. I'm not taking it for granted now. Absolutely. Because I think sometimes you're in danger of that, aren't you, if you're just playing regularly and it's all going well, you, you talk, do take it for granted, but when you have that time out... The curve never yeah. just goes in an upward curve. No, no. You always have these, you know, dips yeah. in the road, and that was a dip, but yeah. it was a big dip. Because it was such a 11 disappointment. Months. 11 months. Uh, uh, probably your prime as well, really, in 28, 29. Probably at the biggest football club I ever played for. Right. I missed 11 months of my career yeah. at Leeds United, which to this day hurts. Yeah. But it probably gave me the grounding for where I went next. Yeah. So, you know, we've had this conversation off screen where what, what was it that you actually liked? the most about football. Some people will say they like the um, the camaraderie. They might like the um, they might like the the games that financially the game can bring you. It wasn't for me. Mine was the game. Right. Mine yeah. was that challenge where if I'm playing against Juju, yeah. I want to do everything I possibly can to make sure that I give myself the best reason to stay, even if it's half an inch in yeah. front of you. And that's what I liked about being a footballer and it it was that realism. Do you mean just on the pitch? Just the game. Just the battle. Game. The battle between so, me and you. Because there, there is a structure and we've, we've spoke about the structure haven't we like and you know you've got to be here at certain times it's all up and you're thinking about from Saturday to Saturday the game so you've got a focus. Yeah. Would you use that time to prepare for that that game there? Right I'm playing against him I'm going to think how I can beat him or would that just come naturally right, I'm playing around today and that just be on the day? And you just get, try and get better from on the pitch. Well, 
my mindset, my my character was always come up three o'clock. I was ready. Yeah. You know. When I was twenty nine, all the way until I was thirty five, I became pretty opinionated as a as a player. Yeah. Same. But regardless of what I'd seen in the week, through good, bad, indifferent management types, when it came to three o'clock on a Saturday, yeah. it didn't matter what I'd heard or what yeah. I'd my my thoughts on things were. I was going to play, not just for me, but I was going to play for the for the badge, yeah. for the fans, for yeah. the football club, and do you know what? For the manager as well. Yeah. Because I think as a player, you've got a responsibility to maximise at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. No, I agree. I agree totally. That, and like I say, that's pretty stood you in real good stead. Possibly, it goes back to the values that we spoke about at the, the start of the interview growing up. Yeah. And family life and, and yeah. the coaches that shaped it. Football never ever runs smoothly. I try and tell this story all the time. If you think that this upward curve is just going to continue, yeah. you, you, you're going to get hurt. You're absolutely. Yeah. You, you're barking up the wrong yeah. tree. Yeah. You're going to have as many downs, probably more downs than ups mm. as a professional footballer. So when it comes to just having an opinion of a certain manager, just because you don't agree with that manager, that doesn't mean that you can't do your job properly yeah. on a Saturday afternoon. No, I make it right. And it was from them years, from 10, looking back on that council estate in Nottingham when you're fighting with 30 other lads ranging from 6 to 18 on that patch of grass at yeah. the end of the, yeah, uh, you know, at, at the end of the terraced house. You usually says no ball games. No ball games. Yeah, and forget that. Get the balls out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, there's one on the old estate. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Really. Yeah, it was. went and knocked on people's doors to borrow it. Yeah. That's what... Yeah, did yeah. That's it. Yeah, great days. Them days. I think they do, don't they? I mean, that, I mean, I don't want to go into that too much, but it, it probably has changed in that way because now it's all on a PlayStation yeah. on your own playing a game on a computer screen against yeah. a computer <laughs> and you don't really you don't really interact with anyone no. you don't really have this like you say you, you, at six, seven years of age you're playing against 13 year olds 14 year olds who are absolutely bullying you everywhere around. absolutely but it does make you tough and it learns street football is, is missing a lot I mean I look at Sane at Man yeah. City say for example and he looks like he's playing street football yeah. for Man City he gets the ball and he's got no fear he just goes yeah. and runs at people and but it's funny because watch. I never had that ability. That wasn't my game. I was a battler. I was uh, probably a street urchin in terms of, you know, I would use every trick in the book to try and get that edge. But my son is very different to me. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a technical player. So I love watching that type of player, whether it's my son or whether it's somebody else, or, you know, if I go and watch a, an academy game on a Saturday morning or, a, sorry, on a Sunday morning, if I see that individuality, that takes me back to what I could see 30 years ago right. on them street corners. Yeah. Somebody uh, just, just, just trying something new. And I want to see more of that. And I want to see people express themselves. And I don't think we're all the same. We're all different. We've all got different characteristics. We've all got different ability levels in terms of footballers. And I just want to see a bit of everything. And that's what I think is missing now in modern day football. What you think, the blend. So you, yeah. you've, got the, you've got the people who, who are, like you say, not as technically gifted, but they'll run them out, they'll get around that pitch, they'll, they'll be a captain, they'll lead yeah. the team. That helps then the flair players go about their business. And yeah. I always remember back in the day, it was like, you need a certain players as bodyguards. Absolutely. Yeah. So if your flair player was going to get kicked in the day because you didn't get the protection to get down. So they had a bodyguard on the pitch and it does take a good blend to make a team. But this is what takes me back to now. So my, my, my outlook now on having been a manager for Knox County and a manager for Cambridge United, now I'm looking further afield. Now I'm looking, I'm delving into what the characteristics is of these junior coaches. And how can they get these more technical, perhaps these rogue characters into our game? Yeah. Because we have a tendency now to open a book yeah. and coach the way the book says. Mm -hmm. it's it says some, that's the right way. Well, it's not. Because my upbringing and your upbringing, Jim, suggests that the coaches that we played under, yeah. they treated everybody as individuals. So like I say, this kid who needs an arm around him yeah. or needs a slap, 
he might need a little bit of a different type of coaching to what Ted Jones needs, who's this straight-lined, yeah. you know, cultured, organised, very grounded midfielder, and it might, there might be a little left winger up there who's more of a street footballer, and he might need a different way of management. And I, I want to see a little bit more of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I want to see it. Yeah. I, I don't see that in the game at this moment in time. No. And it's a shame, isn't it? I agree. Like the, the, some of the stories we speak about with the old youth team managers and players, you remember these stories. You remember the lessons they taught you. And it, it was like that. Yeah. They, they get the best out of everyone and they know how to push them up and to, yeah. to get a win. And that was a winning mentality. Absolutely. And I think now, and I'm a massive advocate, you know, everybody you should always have your structure in terms of your coaching you know the FA the the, 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 the PFA the LMA all these fantastic um, opportunities that young coaches senior coaches have got now to get the badges I think we should get them we absolutely should but through my experience I've I, I, uh, and I've only been managing and coaching now for four and a half five years but my experiences now are from speaking to people on these coaching courses, seeing how they react and seeing how they um, you know, develop young players or develop senior players. You know, I, I, I've been in teams where, like Neil Warnock, Neil Warnock would go and get six, seven, eight senior players to go and run his dressing room. Yeah, morning. he's always done that. He was always scouting, I was there with, yeah. with Neil. He was, that was back in the day. Yeah. Still the day. And it's still the same. Still and getting he, the right results yeah, at Cardiff. Absolutely. Doing a fantastic job. He's done a fantastic job everywhere he's gone. Yeah. So it's a big part of putting that changing room. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of along the way and and, and the teams that I played for and, and the variety of managers that I encountered, there is two or three that just step away from what the normality yeah. would be. Neil being one of them. You know, I look at I look at Neil and Neil signed me twice, and you know he, he, he signed me because he, he could trust me, but he could also trust himself. Yeah. And Neil's probably now, if he was to sat in this seat now, he would he would probably say, yes, he's changed slightly, but his fundamentals are exactly the same now than they were when he he first became a coach at Scarborough. Right. So as a coach at Scarborough, he would have had six or seven leaders in that dressing room and he would definitely have them six or seven leaders at Cardiff where he's at the, at the minute with a th- over a thousand games between Scarborough and yeah. Cardiff. No, absolutely. I, I mean, I always remember the, the lad called Charlie Palmer and he was, he was aging, but he just got the best out of him. He'd come in the changing room in the morning and go, right, we're doing this today. Charlie, what do you want to do, son? And he got oh, a bit stiff today, Gaffer. And he go, you rest then, son, you rest. Anyone's got any problems with that? Play like he does on a Saturday. Absolutely. And everyone would be like, ah, oh. and we'd be going running around a cricket pitch or whatever. Yeah. Charlie would be just walking around having a relax. And two he examples. Best out of him. Two examples of a Charlie Palmer that I encountered with Neil. We had a centre forward at QPR called Heidi Haridison. Yep. Sorry, Heidi Helgerson, not Haridison. Heidi Helgerson. Big number nine. Coming, I think he was 32. He had dodgy hips, but Neil trusted him on a Saturday. Yeah. So what he'd done, he, he, he said to Heide, Heide, you get out on a Thursday, rest on a Friday, but he was our best player on a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. And again, the other, the, 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 the other lad he'd he done it with, which is completely the other end of the spectrum, was Adele Tarrat. Adele Tarrat was 20 years old, so he had no injury problems, yeah. but he knew that Adele would cause a problem because of what Adele was like as a player. You know, he was... Um, wasn't the most professional, his timekeeping was bad, you know, he, he, his mannerisms didn't really kind of, didn't really work well at the football club off the field, but come on, Saturday at three o'clock, he was our best player. He was your best player, oh yeah, the season was incredible, wasn't he? He was our best player, he was incredible. So, so when you're talking about... And that's, that's either side of the spectrum, that's the older player and the younger player. player. And you've got... Right, I'm not going to get on a tangent here because we could, this could be another hour and one. But okay, Matt, if you listen to, if Neil had listened to the sports scientists, say for example, with the RPEs and the things that they stick on their back in the games, my pet hate, by the way. It would, 
they, they would have never done that with Vidal. They'd have said, he's not going to be fit for Saturday. He's got training all week. Or, or at the hell is he be going, he's not, he's not done his minutes, he's yeah. not got these minutes in to get up to a certain point. To that. If you listen to that, they wouldn't have played. No. Now, again, I've had this conversation with, with Neil personally. His boys will have the GPS in the back of his shirts on a Saturday, but they will never, ever influence his size right. for what he sees. He always says, let the GPS and let you know all the sports science department, which has obviously come in um, more deeply into modern day football, let them back up what his eyes see. And I think if you can, if you can have that outlook on sports science, Yes, there's going to be certain areas of sports science where if you're in the red, red zone, of course, you don't want to put that player into that situation where he might get injured. But he would never, ever judge the player on what... He'd rule it. He'd rule it. Yeah. He'd rule it. I think yeah. that, that's sensible. That's a, pro- that's a proper approach. Yeah. Like I said, when you've been in it for that long as well, your experience should tell you. Absolutely. And I agree, there's a place for it. There is a place, and I think that's the best way of looking at it. Yeah. I agree with that. Is the best way I look at it is got to let it show my eyes are right. Absolutely, because not letting me again. It. And I agree with Neil in this, and I agree with not just Neil Warnock, but a number of other managers that I've spoken to. When you're sat there as the manager of whether you're sat there at Cambridge United, which is you know a relatively small football club in um, in, in the pyramid, or whether you sat there at Manchester United. When you're there as a manager, you're there to be shot at. Yeah. So when you're there to be shot at, you should be shot at doing it your own way. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree that, like I said, with, with, with the, the Neil Warnocks and many other managers that I've spoken to, you shouldn't be gauged just by what the sports science department are telling you or giving you the advice they to do. They're not going to get the sack. <laughs> so if you're going to go out and get the sack, you want to do it your way, aren't you? You want to make some sense. So... Going back onto the, getting into the coaching side and management side, you were still playing, uh, you was at QPR, and then did you go, was you on loan at Mill one on the right and saying that? Yeah, yeah, so when you talk about a pathway of you know coaching, a lot of people would probably suggest starting at the bottom, building your way up. But my pathway never really took place that way right. because it was a very, very different one. I was I was on loan at QPR, sorry, I was on loan at Millwall. Um, from QPR and then an opportunity came on a Sunday and um, Knox County had sat their manager and I was doing my A licence my badges and I just wanted an opportunity just to be interviewed right. so I chanced my arm really and I called the chief executive Jim Rodwell on the Sunday afternoon I was actually on a, um, a, a, a I was on an LMA day uh, sorry, uh, a, a PFA day where I was, I think I was up in central London and um, my phone rang and somebody said, oh, Knox County have sacked um, the manager. So my mind, my, my mind went on a tangent and um, I thought I'd love the opportunity just to sit down and speak just for an experience. Yeah. yeah. So thankfully, um, you know, the chief executive Jim Rodwell answered the phone and he seemed pretty um, impressed by me putting myself forward and um, by being an ex Knox County player I was going to say that's going to help the process a little I'm bit. sure that opened the door for me yeah and I, might, I mean on that just quickly with the, when you've been a player there I think that gives you a little bit of leeway yeah. when you first get in there for a few weeks but if you're not good about your job you're yeah. going to get found out as well aren't of you? course yeah you know I think for me by being an ex Notts County um, player and being from Nottingham when the opportunity was given to me on the Tuesday afternoon when I did go for my interview yeah. so you got the phone call was on the Sunday yeah and you went in there didn't you Tuesday and it was That's as quick right. as that so so what you because you was on you were still playing then I was yeah, yeah so did you just say to them look I didn't, I didn't let anybody at Millwall know that I was going for the interview yeah. because I didn't want it to jeopardise yeah. where they thought my mindset was. But I knew that I needed this opportunity. That it was presented, I needed to go there and speak to um, Mr and Mrs True, who was the, um, the owners of Knox County at the time. So I met them in Stamford. I met them um, in the George pub, I think it was called. Um, it is. I live 50 hours from it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful club. Beautiful club. Met them there, met Jim Rodwell, the two the two um the owners, Mr. and Mrs. True. Um and after about five hours I was still there and I thought, well if they're gonna yeah. still listen to me after five hours, i I must be making some sort of impression on them. But in that time, my wife and children had gone on holiday on a Sunday morning. They'd gone to Portugal because it was uh, coincided with the school holidays. So I spoke to my wife on the Tuesday night and I'd been offered the Knox County job. So she was coming back to not me, the player, but because man, really, I'd moved incredible, really, 150 world. miles away into Nottingham, back to Nottingham. So, it, you know, for everything, it was such a massive transition yeah. for the kids because Dad wasn't there every yeah. every day. Yeah. For my wife, because obviously her husband wasn't there every day. And but for me as well, because I wasn't the player no more. That's that's I was the manager. So you don't think about that transition. When you say it like that, that is a total turnaround, isn't it? Because from a player to a manager is yeah. I mean, your time for one thing, as a player you're you are you are that structured, you'll be in at half nine, ten, you'll train at eleven, you 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 probably have to go in the gym or whatever, depending on what day it is, you're yeah. you're off home by one o'clock. Yeah. So you ain't doing that as a manager, you've got games to go and watch and yeah. you know, training to plan. Absolutely. So did you have did you inherit the staff there at the time or and you work with those or did you bring your own at the time? I was given the opportunity to bring in one um, staff member of my own. So I um, I opted for Greg Abbott, who'd been the um, Carlisle manager who I'd known for a number of years since my days at Leeds United. He was the under eighteen manager there. So I spoke to Greg on the um, on the Tuesday and I said, listen, I really want you to come in. He was out of work. He'd left his job at, came, uh, at, at Carlisle. And he was the best signing that I've ever made. Really? The reason being is because he knew League One. Yeah. He knew the mindset. That was in League One at the time, wasn't yeah. it? We was in, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I, I took over Notts County in November and we were bottom of the league. That's right. Fighting. Fighting for our lives. Really down there as well. And, and Div 1, because uh, 4 up and down, is a, yeah. it's tough to get out of as well. I think at the, at the point, I think it was about five or six um, points rooted. Right. From so, coming out of relegation. And that's stuff. halfway through the season as well. Well, it was so a, it's yeah, a tough job. You must be thinking as well, this is, a, this is a tough first job. Was there any, when you spoke to us, you mentioned Mr. Mr. True, was there, was there anything put on you who you have to keep us up this year? Or was it, look, let's, can we stay up and build from there? Or? Well, I knew that me going into Knox County, I was going into a club that had over 40 players, had a big wage bill for the level, a real big one. It was, it was up there in terms of the top six for the wage bill. But what we knew at the time, and everybody knew at Notts County, that it was a real disjointed mm. football club. It was disjointed because I think I was the um, the eighth manager in about three years that Mr. and Mrs. True brought in. So there was this kind of disjointment from the fans to the club right. itself. And I think I was perhaps brought in there to try and bring it all together. Right. Which makes sense, that's a, that's a real good thing yeah. from there, isn't it? Because, you know, as an ex-player and a bit of a legend, a legend there and gone on a great career, and it's like, here I was going back to, to galvanise the club and put it together, so it's quite, you know, shrewd from But there. it was really tough because, you know, at, at that point, there wasn't money being given to us. It was, we had to get rid of players. Um, when you need to get rid of players, sometimes that comes at a financial cost. Um, we needed the 40 odd players to come down to 20, 21, 22. That's a tough first job then, isn't it? That's a and it was, it, it, was, it was a real, it was an eye opener. Just, just going off that, because this is interesting to me, because I've seen it happen in a few ways. When you're told by the chairman you have to cut the wage bill, you have to get rid of the players, did they give you the players that had to go? Or did they say, no, don't care who goes, you just got to get rid and trim it? Mr. and Mrs. True never. Um, forcefully advised me in who to play, but they were very opinionated. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're a young manager, I was 35, 36 at the time, it was so, you know, it was so important that I had Greg next to me yeah. with that experience, yeah. because he was a fantastic, you know, soundboard for me. And he was giving me some great advice. And you know what I'm like as a person and a character. I'm quite single-minded. So, I think they realised that very quickly that I wasn't just 
a young manager who they could manipulate. Right. I had my own views on things. And the end of the season actually turned out to be incredibly successful because we did escape relegation, albeit on the last day of the season. Last day, I remember it. And did you not, you won six out of the last nine, I think, when the stat, which is We did, yeah. Fantastic. I mean, the last nine games, we won six, drew one and lost two. And um, a great one at the end I think, of the you know, down there. we were right down there and it was, you know, I think at that point as well, you know, there was this, we brought the club together. I think the, the, the three or four home games before the end of the season, there was over 10,000 fans really, at the really, game, really. which was great because fans started to believe again. Yeah. And we created this atmosphere where it was literally us, and I mean those in terms of me and Greg and the close coaching um, group that we had and the close group of players against the world. Brilliant. And it was against the world, including the ownership at the time. Was it? Because the ownership at the time felt still not really tight with the club yeah, and the fans, it was very much the fans and the management together. Did you have that in your? Did you have that in your mind? That I'm going to create this. I'm going to create this atmosphere. That it's the, and get us really tight. But is that just something that, that happened? That you thought I could use this? We needed to. We we needed to grab hold of something that gave us a chance. Yeah. And we needed to just move certain parts away from us that would either have a definite negative yeah. influence on us or couldn't influence us. At all, right. So we did. It was us against the world, and we managed to do it. And then, what disappointed me most about that time at Notts County was that, in the course of the the previous uh, close season, our budget was cut dramatically. So this is. So you've stayed up, but Notts done done a fantastic job. It was like a miraculous stay up, really. You win them at the last games. Go with some of you're thinking, right, I'm going to come in, let's, we've sort of got everyone together again now, let's, let's have a right go at it this year. That must be your mindset. But it was, you know, I, I remember sending a text out to all the, exi- you know, the, the players going into um, contract next season and the existing staff members to saying, we can do this, we can achieve. Mm. And we did, you know, although the budget was cut, which disappointed me greatly, because I felt like on the back of what had been yeah. a real successful Momentum time. Momentum was so hard to get going, didn't it? Momentum, we had it. And we stayed up, and I think we were sat in the top six all the way until the middle of January. And then we had a real... Um, we fell off the face of the mm. cliff, we really did. Four very influential players left in that window, and we couldn't replace it. Was, was that the club's decision? Yeah. To, to get rid was that financial was that to it was it, it was a financial decision because um, Forrest at that time I, I was able to you know really build a good relationship with um, Stuart Pierce, who was then the, the Forest manager mm-hmm. and we had um, a couple of Forest players who were our best players and one or two other players who really really contributed and all four left mm-hmm. and from then on we literally fell so I got sacked with, I think, nine, ten games to go of the season. But we still weren't in the bottom four, although we was right on the edge of it. And nobody believed that we would get relegated. So we still had the players. Yeah. Me and Greg still had the players. And the players still had themselves and the belief that we would still achieve. Yeah. Because it's funny, really, because when you're a player, you see this taking place. Because players aren't stupid. They could see that the four best players had left. Um, with the greatest respect to the lads that we brought in, we was bringing in players from Derby and other play- places at 18, 19 years old. Tough. And it was tough. So it changed the dynamics of the dressing room. But within it, we still felt we could achieve. So you still kept a nice little uh, group you want, your group you've got left there together. Yeah. And you still got them. So did they go down that season? So you yeah. got a set with 19 games to go. Yep. And they just, they carried on and went down from there. Yeah, I mean, you know, Ray True and Alien True, they decided that to give them the best opportunity that me and Greg needed to leave. But the players yeah. didn't want that. Yeah, they didn't we sound. were very much... I can together. remember at the time, I mean, I spoke to you, I think, just after it, and just said, oh, I thought it was a, a really bad decision. 
because I think I, I think we, I was I was a uh, uh, Gillingham or Peterborough at the time. Yeah, it was Gillingham much here, and you you still had decent size. You still looked like you you yeah. used to have it constantly. You weren't one well, that thought would get sucked into it. Twelve months prior to that, same situation. We won six, drew one, and lost two in the final nine games. And I'm not saying that we would have done that again. Yeah. I mean, we didn't need to do that again because you know the points per game ratio was very different. But we, it was, it was still within our thoughts. Yeah. It was still recent that we'd actually done that as a football yeah, yeah, club. So it surprised me that you know we we, we were given the sack at that point. Yeah, it don't seem like the the greatest of decisions. No disrespect, you know, it doesn't sound like a real footballing decision, does it? You've not really thought about it. And sadly, the club fell into League Two, which you know, being a Notts County fan, yeah. playing and that's for as well, isn't it? not. So it's not given a chance as well to, to steer him away from that danger and, and kick on must even more because you know there's such good times then. Yeah. Like you say he was a fan before. Mm. So that's a tough time. So when you got to say, just did they just come in and say, that's it, go let you go? We lost we lost four one away at late, um, at MK Dons who were flying at that yeah. point. I think we were two one up with about eight minutes to go. We lost four one. I got a phone call on the Friday uh, on the Sunday night and it was um, Aileen, the chairman's wife. And I knew because it, she didn't ring on a Friday night. Right. So I knew then that I, I'd have to travel back to Nottingham, say my goodbyes, right. you know, sign your forms, what you do, and walk away from Notts County. But I didn't want to look back through animosity or full of disappointment. I looked back at my 17 months spent at Notts County, even when I was saying my goodbyes to the boys very privileged that I've been given an opportunity to be a manager and looking forward yeah and I knew that I wanted to spend some time out of the game because it management consumes you yeah and it completely takes over every waking moment of your day right and I needed that rest even though I didn't want the rest to take place yeah yeah I did need to come on and spend time back with the kids and my wife again yeah yeah I think that's that's a that's a positive, great positive way of looking at it as well. I always remember, I was just thinking there when you said it, I remember Warnock, when he got the sack at uh, Notts County, back in the day, and he was, I mean, unparalleled success when he was there, and then had a couple of not so good seasons. And he his mindset was very much like that. I remember him going, in, the day he got the sack, he came in and said a few untruths to a few players, and but, you know, wished them all the best, and I remember him and Mick Jones, his assistant, was, was sat there, invited all the press in from the good times that they had over a yeah. few years, got the champagne out so I've never seen anything like it like you've just got the sack he's got the champagne and he's going listen this is you know yeah we've got the sack results are not what we wanted but look at what we've done absolutely this is, this is a celebration of the, of the yeah. time I've spent here so when you were saying that then that just took me back to what was, I've never seen that and I thought it was brilliant and I think you know in the times that I've been back to Medellin as the manager of Cambridge United the fans recognise that and you know again I think it helps by being a previous yeah. player but you know the but you've got to do the appreciation well, yeah. that I've been given back at Notts County probably there's an understanding of that perhaps it ended too soon yeah um, but this is why I'm sat here now is because obviously you know I've had a different experience at Cambridge United yeah and again how do you measure success what how is that measured when you're a mid, medium to lower level League 2 club is it measurement are you just deemed a failure or you've not achieved because you're not in the top seven or actually do you look at it from a different angle and perspective and saying well Cambridge United when I took over Cambridge United was a team sat in 18th position and we had two close to top 10 finishers yeah. finishing um, ninth and 11th that's really good I mean what your win ratio is really good as well isn't it well it is and again you know it's very hard sometimes for managers to actually look at the bigger picture but I think it's clear that you have to do that otherwise you can become too down and disillusioned in what you haven't achieved yeah. I think from my angle looking at it on the in the cup half full rather than half empty is an outlook that I want to take forward yeah. so again you know I've hit a point now where I am out of work um, I have left my post but I'm not daunted 
by being out of work and leaving a post. Right. Because I've experienced it before. And them experiences yeah. are going to stand you in good stead as well. I mean, you've had a couple of tough ones. I mean, the Notts County second was really tough, I think, and, you know, and harsh. I mean, you spoke about that. Just to get that chance to stay away from danger would have been fantastic, wouldn't it? But, so you went to Cambridge, just going back. So how long? Because you said you needed a little relax and recharge the battery sort of thing and get a bit of time away from it yeah. and get a different perspective on it. How long was it then before you went back into... To Cambridge? Yeah, I was seven months out of work. Um, left Notts County in March and got appointed manager of Cambridge United in November. No, that, was, that, was that a tough time in there? Because you've gone from playing all the time where everything's really structured mm. to managing where you've got to put the structure in. Absolutely. To actually, yeah. do I get up? Do I, I'll take the kids to school. Now, what do I do? Is, it, yeah. is that a tough time or is that? do you quite enjoy that time more? The early conversations that I had with people I respect in the game, they really helped me because they encouraged me to keep a structure to my day. Right. And then, this, is, this is managers and people who've gone yes. through that already. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a great You know, and, and I wanted to use the time effectively to gain more knowledge, to gain more experience, to go out and see how different people work, to keep relationships Okay. So you you went you did that you yeah. went out to watch the clubs and went out to work with them see how different managers yeah. work that and you know that's a really productive way of doing that as well and that's what I've well. done as a manager as well that you know my doors are always you know completely open even for managers in work because I think what the English game has a tendency to do is to shut the doors and to make everything top secret I don't think that does anybody any good no. so I quite often open the doors to the training ground open the doors to my office even open the doors to match day where managers or coaches or ex-players could sit in and experience just what a team talks yeah. like just what a training that's session great. looks like I mean imagine the opportunity to do that it's fantastic and a lot like I say it's just quite guarded normally yeah. it's a very guarded world I mean obviously we're speaking on DNA that was my, part of the reason for DNA was to to try and make it more accessible yeah. to people. So you're doing that as a manager, which which is great for your testament to your character, because some people get a little bit, I mean, a lot a lot get very paranoid in the job and thinking he's after me job or he could do this. Yeah. And, so it's a tough, it's a tough business. So open the doors is... Of course, right. and you, you know... Did that help you? Did that help you open the doors? Did you think, I've, my, I've got to be bang on it today because I've got more people watching, I've got another manager watching, so it might test you a little bit. Uh, I think it should always be kept on your toes. I think it should always be tested. Um, going forward, you know, you need staff around you. And, 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 and thankfully, I've had some great staff members that I've worked with, you know, two assistant managers in Greg Abbott and Joe Dunn at Cambridge United who keep you on your toes yeah. and question you in the right way. So you want, you want your staff to do that? Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Yeah. I think I'd want to be tested. So. I mean, I've obviously worked with a lot of managers myself now, and I don't think there's any point in hiring someone if you haven't got an opinion. Right. Because how are you going to know if you're right or wrong? And, if you just... and not only that, but who's to say my way is the right way? You know, for, for, I think managers sometimes, and I've experienced this in the past, is that it's their way or no way. Yeah. How can you be that? Like you say, you, you mentioned before, it's, it's, you're all consumed when yeah. you're a manager, aren't you? Everything's just consumed. And it, uh, there must be some points where it just gets on top of you yeah. and you actually can't see the clear picture. So you have to, someone to say, well, listen, yeah. Gaffer, what about this? Yeah. Just might make you think a different route. Well, this is, again, why at this stage of being out of work, it's important that that structure's the same. And it doesn't phase me being out of work because I actually quite enjoyed the certain moments of being out of work from Notts County because it allowed me to go yeah. and re-educate and evaluate the time that I've spent at Notts County and I'm doing that now yeah. and re-educating myself and evaluating yeah, the time at Cambridge. And that's, that's a real valuable lesson isn't it, as well for people. Like you said, you, you spoke to a lot of managers, you've got the fortunate position, you, you sort of know these managers and you can pick up the phone to them. Yeah. So to get their, use their experiences is fantastic. And so if what you're saying is when you get the sack, keep a nice structure, go and re relearn, do things you can't do when you're a manager. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a... That's a and also, thing. you know, 
if you've got kids and uh, uh, you know if you're in a relationship if you're married if you know if you've got a girlfriend whatever it is use this time yeah. because sadly there's another side to the story and that's your partners that's the kids who get affected by football management yeah and nobody ever sees that picture no that's so really when important. you're actually away from the game and you've got that opportunity to spend quality time with the family try and spend it yeah because these moments don't last forever no absolutely you know my son and daughter are doing their sport they're not going to be doing their sport at 10 and 11 years old forever no you need to go and see that if you can do it, yeah no I bet you're right and I did see Sean on Instagram as well sledging <laughs> terrible technique <laughs> <laughs> but no you're right it is it's a, and uh, the, you, I think you've got a bang on outlook on it what, what I can see because it's, you, you're still you're disappointed of course way things go, but you've kept a real positive attitude you're going to, going to learn again and you know the future is going to be I mean, Brighton. Because I mean, I'm, obviously, when you're at Cambridge, you had a really good side. I mean, obviously, I'm at Lincoln, and we analyse a lot of the, the football and, and Stuart, our analyst, who does all the, all the way he watches all the games, yeah. building up to it, four or five games. And in the four or five games leading up to playing against us, when you actually got the sack, you was really good. Your team was excellent. You had a really good side to the point you played lovely football, but you still had a bit of steam about you. You looked like being dangerous every time. So. We was we was wondering why he was you know under a bit of pressure really. Well, I think the pressure was slightly different in terms of Cambridge to what it was at Notts County, because those that are obviously in and around Cambridge United and, and read the local press, they will understand perhaps what I'm saying. But to a wider public, it probably came as a shock. While uh, you know, I left Cambridge United as manager or head coach. Because you're in a decent position. We were, we were just, we were probably not a big budget. I, I can imagine you had, you'd got a decent team together yeah. and, and playing some good stuff. So, so from a footballing perspective, we'd lost some valuable players, and at any level, losing the most valuable valuable players and your sure. you know your your best players, it has a negative effect on you. But if you look at it from a different angle, and that's from the ownership angle of Cambridge United. Um, Dave Doggett, the chairman who employed me as the manager for Cambridge United, he'd left. He'd left six weeks or eight weeks prior to me leaving my position, my post, and we had a new incoming board, basically, yeah. a new ownership, yeah. albeit an existing director who was who owned a large part of the NM shares. He then was going to be taking full control over Cambridge United at a later date. So when the chairman leaves, when the interim board develops, knowing that there's going to be a new chairman arriving at some point, you take stock and you think, there's a lot of change taking mm -hmm. place here. And I was partial to some of the conversations that took place. And I knew that Paul Barry, the new chairman, was going to come in and wanted to make wholesale changes. And I think at the time I was ready for that. Right. I think the football club were ready for that, and I was ready for that. So the time it happened, it actually happened after the Oval loss, when we lost 2-0 away from home, prior to playing you guys at Lincoln. So that's a week before you played, as a, or was that the Saturday, or... Because we played you on the Tuesday, didn't we? No, we played you on the Friday night. Friday night, it was a Friday night, yeah, that's... Yeah. But I'd already agreed to leave Cambridge United on the Sunday morning after the previous game against the Oval. So you took the week's training... And you took the game against Lincoln, which is, you know, was the decent nil-nil game. You probably could, could have, should have beat us that day, I think, or that night. So you knew all that week leading up to that, yeah. you was gone. Did you know you was under pressure? Well, you, you just said it, but did you sort of know whatever you did before that, your, your time was going to be up there? I knew that this new chairman and this new board wanted change. I knew Just that. because they wanted change? Just because, you know, I think, again, how do you measure success? Yeah. How do you look upon a successful period, which was a successful period for over two years? Yeah, Again, coming from 18th, finishing in 9th and 11th, that is major improvement. Yeah. Again, different structural changes, going from manager to head coach, which was a, a change for me personally. So how does that work? So what's the, I don't know, I don't know the difference. What's the, well, manager to head coach, right? 
is that your the, is that your parameters? Goal? Jimmy, it was just the parameters that you worked to. So we had a director of football, well, a head of football operations yes. came in. So he basically ran the day-to-day -day movements of a football club, right. and I took control of what was on the pitch. Right. And you know, the, did you the like how that works? I just is that workable? I, yes, I don't. I, I believe it's workable, but I think it's very difficult when a structure changes mm. at any point. When you, if I was to be enrolled as the manager of Cambridge United, to then change your role and mm. become a different yeah. type of coach, which was the head coach, I think it has an effect. Yeah. I think it has an effect on me personally, yeah. but I think it has an effect on the overall picture. Yeah, and it did. Well, the players, do you think that'd be negative for the players? Because the players will see this, and like I said, players aren't stupid. They, no, no. as much as you, as a manager, will keep them away from it. The players read the press, and they'll yeah. they know what's going on around the place. Does that have a negative effect on on them as well? Does that affect your position with them? I think you'll get the players. You know, you'll always get the players. Those that sit on one side of the fence, those on the other, and those who sit right in between. You want to try and keep as many on this side of the fence yeah. as possible. But those that are sat on the other side, and you get that at every single football club, whether you're at the top of the Premier League or at the bottom of League Two, you get that element of, uh, of players. You don't want to give them a voice. And suddenly, them kind of, them little voices that sometimes become a little bit louder when things change, they become a little bit yeah, louder. Yeah, yeah, so they get more of that voice, yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's possibly what happened. No, I think what happened, and you know, the conversations that I've had with the hierarchy at Cambridge United is that they just want to change. So that has obviously come along. And now I've left Cambridge United and Joe, my assistant, has done incredibly well and has kept, you know, a lot of what we were working on together yeah. is kept that going. Kept that going. So we've got the continuity there. Yeah, the continuity is there. there. So it's not like they're not they're not gonna point at anyone, do they just carried on your work as well yeah. and your and Joe's work yeah. together through Joe. Yeah, I think so. I think so, but it was a strange. I mean, if I go on, it was a strange night because obviously it was a nil-nil game. I went in, you go into the office after and have a, a diet coke, <laughs> Corona, <laughs> <laughs> with the manager and have a chat about the games and you have that fake stuff of who you, who you play next and all that, which which is rubbish. But it, it would be nice to see you after because I know you and that and and Joe as well. But going in there after, like we'd learned the news you'd had the sack. Yeah. I didn't realise it was the week before, so you knew that all that week. Did you keep that from your staff? I kept the staff, in, or I kept the staff in, involved. I told them on the Monday morning, um, but I kept it away from the players. You know, it was a, um, it was a decision that I felt allowed the players to keep control ready for the weekend's game, which was Lincoln on the Friday night. I didn't want to go in there and kind of give them every single bit of information because I don't think players need that. I think they need to be informed, but uh, they're not stupid. And I think certain players probably could sense something was taking place. Right, right. yeah, because it was a strange atmosphere going on after you speak to all your staff and they all got it because you've gone and, yeah. and I said, uh, after a decent resort, like I said, a decent side being put together. Yeah. Well, I was, it's funny because I was in, I literally, finished the game, told the boys that I was leaving, and then I was in... She told me to change room after? Yeah. And then I was in a car within two minutes of the game, just gone, finishing. And I was... I'm well, that, I was actually hoping as well you had a chat with Dan, our manager. <laughs> because during the game, one of the funniest things I've seen, Dan, <laughs> I shouldn't really laugh at him, and I think, do it's, it's great, I love the banter between the, the benches as well. Yeah. And I remember Dan, I think you had a ball come over the top, at uh, the stands or something, someone punted it, one of our players probably. You've got a little touch and it's gone a couple of yards that way and Dan... As normal. I think Dan sort of went, well, yeah, better touch than that. Yeah. And he said, nice shoes or something by them. And, you went, <laughs> <laughs> and I think Sean was on the lines of, don't worry about these shoes. And you just pull them copers up a bit tighter. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, on, on the night, you know, I, I've managed against Danny now twice and uh, everybody's different. I think it's great. We've all got different traits. We've all got different management styles. You know, Danny's got a different personality trait to what mine is. You, 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 you collide, or you know, you, you get on. But when it comes to that ninety minutes, and Danny will be the same as me. 
you do absolutely everything you, you possibly do. can you to try and get the upper hand. And if that comes to verbals, it comes to verbal. It's very similar to playing as well, isn't it? Like you're playing against your man there, like you said about earlier. If you've got to talk him out of being a better player, maybe you talk him out of being a better yeah. player. If you've got to go and smash him and collide, yeah. you'll do that to get the upper hand. So it's, I suppose from your playing career, you can use that experience to take in the manager side as well. Yeah, and I think ultimately, right at the very end of it, when that 95 minutes has been played and you are sharing that corona afterwards, Right, the best thing you've got to do is you've got to shake hands with the opposite, that opposite opponent. Definitely. Because you have to that mutual respect. Yeah. This is the toughest job. Yeah. Sat as a football manager. Yeah, it has to be. Because you're accountable for every single decision yeah. that takes place Monday to Friday, including Saturday, which is the most important day of the week. And everybody has an opinion. And you've got, whether you've got 5,000 fans watching you or 55,000 fans. Everybody picks the best team at five o'clock on a Saturday. Absolutely, yeah. No that hindsight's a wonderful thing. You don't want to lose at five o'clock. And that's what differentiates, you know, people, personnel, characteristics, different types of people who are willing to put their, um, you know, put themselves in this position. Yeah. Well, I think just going forward, like, with your like say your personality and your experience you've got now as well I know you're going to go on again and you know the future's very bright I mean what, what, what do you see in the future would you like to go back into management straight away would you like to see different things abroad would you, is there a... I'm open flexible um, I don't ever want to just cocoon myself into one um, part of football so that I say that in terms of could I go and work with other people absolutely I know what it's like now for a manager to be properly supported. I understand what I, you know, the, the desires I had to have a real support network around mm-hmm. me. I feel that I could do that to somebody so else. You, you, you could, you think you could. Yeah, could. It must be tough if you've been a manager yeah. and everything's your decision. It must be tough then to go on to this one and have a different opinion. But then I suppose if you do it right, you can only be of benefit to a... I think you need to show your flexibility as a, as a, as a person, mm-hmm. as a personality and as a character. And um, so I would be open to that, but I also would be open to another opportunity to be manager, to be head coach. Football is the best game, you know, in the world for me, and it's given me a fantastic, you know, background and hopefully future as well. But it's not just played in England, it's played all over the world. So, again, the flexibility of perhaps flying somewhere else and, and seeing what it looks like in Absolutely. different countries is an option. They can only help as well, can't it? So yeah. things and maybe, you know, take your experience out there, they might be able to use bits off you as well. You, you know. But at the same time, you know, what we're doing now, you know, we're sitting two, two different personalities with this shame, this same desire and this love of the game is sitting and talking and it... And, I love how we talk all day. And, and, it, and, and actually, going on camera and speaking to people who perhaps don't see this side of a story. You know, I yeah. think football now is very regimented. To kind of go around and talk about different things is yeah. something that I want to do as well. Well, well like I said about, um, and I'm, you know, I'm delighted to say as well, me and Sean obviously get along with some great ideas on stuff, and you're going to help us with DNA and do a lot more, lot more work on there yeah. together. And so I'm, I'm absolutely delighted about that. I know you will, and you, you're all going to love what we've got coming. So, it, and that is what you speak about, the accessibility. The whole thing about the DNA, the football DNA, and the, and the platform we've got is to share it and Absolutely. share experiences. Because people, are, like I say, we've been so fortunate yeah. to be able to you know, work with these managers, experience these characters, play in them big games. I mean, there's not, for me, there's nothing like that changing room before a game. I used to love that, and then running out onto the pitch to play the games. Yeah. Still a thing I think I'll miss forever. And that, that, you know, and that, that battle you have yeah. on the 90 minutes to try and get the upper hand is, Absolutely. is the one. So people can see that when you're out there, but they can't actually see what you do before that to get to that point yeah. as well. So I think what, you know, to make it accessible to everyone like that, I think this is why I'm, I'm buzzing with this. I'm, I'm buzzing that well, we're going to be able to with us. You know, here at Football DNA, you know, if we can highlight certain things that perhaps you wouldn't see Monday to Friday, how the footballers and how the coaches and the managers 
and the and the support staff get ready for what's the most important part of the week, which is a Saturday afternoon, three o'clock until five o'clock. If we can give any sort of inspiration, Absolutely. advice, um, experience from different avenues, through my experience, through Jimmy's experience, through many other people who we're trying to open these doors to, to help everybody be the best they possibly can be, then I think this is a, a valuable tool for yeah. everybody. No, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, and it is, and like I say, there's so much stuff in the game now that people don't realise as well. And we can hopefully open it up to people and, and give them on to give you, like the young coaches we spoke about, who are going to have your boy, my, my boys, in their hands and their, you know, their future is going to be sort of in them. If, if they can look at that as well, we can inspire them in any way or give them one or two ideas. Absolutely. That can only help everyone. And like you say, be the best you can be is, yeah. is the end of the game. I've said this to you before, Jimmy. It's my, my outlook on life, on, on, on football, on coaching, on management, playing, is open the door. Let people walk in because whatever style or structure or, or session that I have put on, you'll do it differently. Yeah, of course you'll. You take, you, I see it now. And so will the person who's listening to this interview now. Yeah. So, well, even the drills we've got on there, you'll look at them absolutely. And, and you'll go, oh, I like that. I, yeah. I might tweak that to my players. Or And it's not my drill. And it's not your no. drill. And it's not your drill. It's everyone's it's drill. A football. It's a football drill. Yeah. And that's why we're involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. I really enjoyed every minute of that and you know I hope you're going to take a lot away from that I know you will some great insight into management coaching you know the career and the characters we've seen really enjoyable can't wait for you to see it on DNA and all the other good stuff we've got going on so mate thanks again that was top draw cheers cheers Jimmy thanks